of all the kids that I get to preach to on Sunday morning, when we do the Time for Young Disciples, it is always the most wonderful and sometimes also the most challenging to, to preach to my own child because he hears from me every day and he, he knows everything I'm going to say. And sometimes it's harder to give a message to someone who, who's familiar to you. But I'm very glad that every day I get a chance to show them God's love. And I hope that when we have those time for young disciples, when we have those moments in worship, that it's a moment that I get to connect with the kids and just kind of show them by my being with them that God cares for them. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. This comes as the final installment of our sermon series, God's Economy where we explore issues of wealth, poverty, and faith, issues that touch on the substance of our lives and the means by which we provide for ourselves and others, issues that are often at the core of our identities. This morning, we consider the promise that God provides. God feeds the birds of the air and clothes the lilies of the fields, and you and I are of much more value than they, so why do we worry about food and clothing and the other necessities of life? How might we simply trust the promise of God? And at the same time, if God truly provides for all people, if God provides for us, why does God not seem to provide for others? These are among the questions that are raised by today's reading, which is the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Listen for the word of the Lord. Therefore, I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the non-believers who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. If we truly believed the promise God makes in this passage, if I truly believed the promise God makes in this passage, the world would be transformed. In our reading this morning, Jesus focuses on food and clothing. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. First of all, when Jesus says, do not worry, he is using a very intense form of that word, worry. He's not saying that you're doing something wrong if you have anxiety about an upcoming test or a job interview. He's not saying that you're doing something wrong if you worry about how your kids are doing at school or how you're going to manage to put dinner on the table while also driving 7 million people to 7 million activities. It's okay. It's okay to feel anxiety. In this passage, Jesus is not criticizing the feelings we feel. He's saying, don't be consumed by worry. Don't be so full of anxiety that worry becomes the primary aspect of who you are. Don't be, don't let worry eat away at every aspect of your waking life and some part of your sleeping life too. Don't be consumed by worry, especially not about food, about clothing, about clean water. In fact, though Jesus mentions these three things specifically, the implication is that he's speaking about all the necessities of life. Don't be consumed by the anxiety that you or others you love will somehow have to go without the basic things that are needed for survival. God is concerned about your shelter, and God will provide. 
God is concerned about your clothing, and the Lord will provide warm clothes. God is concerned about the food and the beverages that sustain your life, and God will provide enough for you and for those you love. God is concerned about you having meaningful work to do, because that's another need for human beings. Whether meaningful work is rewarded with a paycheck or is simply a labor labor of love, at home or at church or at Heartland Camp, God will provide us with meaningful work to do. God is concerned about love, and God will provide people in your life who will make the Lord's love feel real to you. These are all things that we need, and the Lord provides them. And if we doubt that for a second, all we have to do is look at the birds who flutter around in the air and see how there's enough food for them that they can simply pluck what they need right off the ground. God provides for them. Some of us with our backyard bird feeders are the instruments that God uses to provide, but I suspect that the birds would be okay without us because God provides. And if we doubt that for another second, all we have to do is look at the lilies of the field, how they don't drive themselves mad by off-the-wall work hours, how they're not consumed by ambition and fear, how they neither toil nor spin or earn, they neither toil nor spin to make or earn their clothing. But Jesus tells us even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. And Jesus goes on to say that if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the non-believers who strive for all these things. And indeed your heavenly Father knows you need these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's a simple promise. Strive first for the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Can you imagine what the world would be like if we truly believed in this promise? Can you imagine how the world might be transformed if the billion or so people who claim belief in Christ, the billion or so people who worship the same God as you and me, can you imagine how the world might be transformed if all of us suddenly decided to believe in this promise? We would no longer toil or spin. We would no longer be consumed by the anxiety that we might go without or that people we love might go without. We would no longer think, I have to work hard enough so that I can earn enough, so that I can meet some modern misshaped standard of what I have come to believe I need. I can trust that whatever I need, God will provide, and that my calling is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, to seek God's agenda first and not my own. At other points in this series, you have heard me lament that I know people who live their lives by this promise. I lament that I know people who live their lives by this promise because I would greatly prefer to just dismiss it. I'd prefer to dismiss this promise as idealistic. I'd prefer to dismiss the idea of living it out as unrealistic. But I know people who have given up so much many of the trappings of financial security that you and I consider necessary. And Eric Garbison, who preached for us last Sunday, is one of those people. I know people who have given up so many of the trappings of financial security that you and I consider necessary so that they might pursue first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, so that they might pursue without encumbrance a life of service and giving for those who are in the most desperate need And God provides. Just as he promises here, God provides. Earlier in our series, we heard Jesus tell a rich young man, go, sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. That particular young man went away grieving, but then Jesus' disciple Peter proclaimed that he and his fellow disciples had done that very same thing. Look, he said, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus replied that Peter and others would be richly rewarded in heaven. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on his throne of glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, ruling the twelve tribes of of Israel. 
And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sister or, mo- or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Many who are first will be last and the last will be first. The values of this world tell us to strive more than anything to be first first, to be winners, to be champions, to be at the top of our field, to be in the prime of our lives, to be at the top of our game. But Jesus says many who are first will be last and the last will be first. In my reading of scripture, I've never heard Jesus say, blessed are those who accumulate everything. But I have certainly heard him bless those who gave up everything for his sake. In all my reading of scripture, I've never heard Jesus say, blessed are those who are comfortable. But I have heard him bless those who forsake comfort, who forsake security, who forsake luxury, and instead privilege first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I wish that were not the case. But that's what's in the scripture. Of course, I've also said in this series that I have no immediate plans to live into these ideals. I'm not going to sell my house or my family's vehicles. I'm going to keep saving for retirement. I'm not ready to give up the things I believe I've earned, the things I'm grasping tightly with my two hands that I'm not yet willing to give over to God, even though I know that God asks for absolutely everything and promises that when I give it all, I will discover a true self lurking beneath the facade of all the things I believe I've accomplished for myself. I believe that God calls for everything I have to give and that I'm not yet willing to give up everything. But I also believe it's important to hold ideals that feel out of reach for us. That ideals, even when they even when they feel out of reach for us, sometimes especially when they feel out of reach for us, point the way to where we should be going. These ideals help us understand what growth looks like. They help us understand what God would have us do, the steps that we can take to grow to be more like God. And in this case, even if we fall short of fully believing the promise of this passage, we can take steps toward living like we believe it. Even if we fall short of everything, we can take steps forward. And so, some of us are absolutely at the subsistence level when it comes to how much we work and for our financial security. Some of us are at the subsistence level and we don't have a choice about how we approach work and how we approach questions of finance. We just have to get by each day. But for those of us who do have a choice, for those of us who may be able to work less than we currently do, for those of us who have a choice, we can choose more sanity when we are able. We can breathe, we can rest, we can prioritize time with family and time for church. We can eschew the seven million activities that drive us and all the ambitions that fuel them and narrow ourselves down to the most important things. We can strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and we can make that the very first thing instead of all the other things that often come first, instead of all the other things that crowd out what God is telling us, instead of all the other things that seem to drive our time and drive our decisions and drive what our priorities are. When we have the choice, we can choose to trust that God's promise holds, that we and others will have the things we need, and to let the extra work go so that we can put first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But what about those who don't have enough? One thing that has long troubled me about about this passage and this promise is those who go without. For me, I thank God each day for providing me with the basic necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, clean water, good health, meaningful work, and most of all, love. Each day, I thank God for providing these things, and each day I'm confronted by the reality of people who go without them. I'm confronted by a world that produces enough food to feed 9 billion people with an adequate nutritious diet. 
And even though there's only 7 billion of us in the world, we still have 60 million people who die each year of starvation and malnutrition. I think of those people who die because they go without having enough food, even though enough food is there. I think of people who live without clean water. I think of the homeless in our city. I think of refugees who have given up everything as they flee in desperation. And I should say at this point that I don't assume that those who have less than I do are worse off than I am. There are many people in developing countries who have a lot less than we do and are much happier than we are. And that has to make us question the value of the things we value and the worth of the things we strive for. So I don't automatically assume that those who have less than me are worse off than me. But the realities that trouble me are the people that God doesn't seem to provide for. Those who are so poor they do not have an adequate nutritious diet. Those who deal with waterborne diseases from rivers that should never be touched by human skin. Why doesn't God provide for them? but then I hold some of these other realities in the light. I see them in the light of Jesus' words to the rich young man to go and sell all he has, and I see them in the light of Peter's declaration that he and his fellow disciples have given up everything, and I see them in the light of this promise, the promise of this passage, that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be provided. And I realized that if we truly believed that promise, if I truly believe that promise, if the billion or so Christians all around the world truly believe that promise, the world would be transformed. And suddenly we would see that there is enough that God has provided. When the things that God has provided are shared, we will suddenly see that there is enough for the world and the promise of God would be made real for all people. We may not get there until we get to the kingdom of God. We may not get there until the kingdom of God is not just something we talk about, but something that God brings about. We may not fully realize this reality of sharing what we have, this reality of those who go without suddenly having what they need, we may not realize this as a reality until God brings the kingdom of God on earth. And that is in many ways what this table symbolizes. That here is a place where all are welcome. Here is a place where all gather. Here is a place where there's an abundant feast with more than enough for all who come. And it symbolizes the reality that will one day be, the reality of a world that God leads, the reality of a world where everything is shared, the reality of a world where there is enough and people recognize God's provision and feel God's provision. And it's not just something we talk about, but it's real for everyone. We foreshadow that right here. As we come to this table, we prepare our hearts for it by passing God's peace with one another. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace of Christ.